Yeah. First time for the AICHC local section also. So okay. So the first, premier. first time that we have a joint meeting here. Yeah. That's right. All right. Uh, Bushy, would you please yeah. continue and introduce our guest? Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm so delighted to see so many people, especially uh, uh, from UFL, UK, from Sweet Kimmy. And it's my great pleasure to introduce our very special um, guest uh, and um, invited speaker, Dr. Roel Prince from uh, the University um, of uh, uh, in, in Zurich, ETH. Uh, I can do it. I can do it. You should know that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I should. Actually, I got my undergraduate there, so I'm, I'm so delighted to, to um, hear Dr. Prince speak. Um, Dr. Prince um, received his um, PhD in physical chemistry from the University of Amsterdam, uh, and then he joined the Shell Laboratory, where he's um, also worked in Amsterdam for about 10 years, he told me. Um, and then he decided he had enough rain in Amsterdam, and he went to California for a year to work also again with Shell. Um, that was in Emery Emeryville in California. And then he became a professor of uh, inorganic chemistry going back to Holland, um, this time uh, in Eindhoven. And uh, he again decided to go back to California, must have really liked it, this time going to Berkeley, very impressive um, sabbatical uh, year in Berkeley. And uh, after that, uh, Professor Prienz was appointed um, professor at the Eidgenössische Technik Hochschule in uh, Zurich. And um, he has been focusing on sulfides, zeolites, and especially also XFs uh, to characterize uh, catalyst, catalysts. And it's our great pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Prienz. Please help me welcome you. Thank you very much for your very friendly introduction. <coughs> yes, for those of you who don't um, know the translation of Eidgenössische Technische Hochschule, um, um, Eidgenössische means something like, um, goes back to the oath of the, um, the Genossen, the, uh, the boys, uh, did in the uh, 1300s when uh, Switzerland was founded. So it, it, it means our institution is a federal school of technology. It's federal. And there are only two federal schools in the country because the country is very decentralized. So the universities are belonging to the canton, let's say, to your state. And uh, so we are one of the two only. Uh, that mistake, as they sometimes say, was only made uh, once in 1856. You know that the, uh, or you may know that in the German, to stay with this example of the ETH, and let's say here is a uh, picture of the uh, main building. Well, this main building is from 1856, and it goes uh, back to those days because um, after the Napoleonic War, the Germanic countries realized that they had been beaten severely by uh, Napoleon, by the French. And uh, they asked themselves why. Is it because Napoleon was so good, or is there more to it than that? And so the answer to them was, it can't be human, so it has to be technology. And the technology was the Ecole Militaire, the military schools, which the French had already, and they were quite good. So the Germans thought, let's build technical universities. So in those days, Europe was still united. It was before the First World War. That sort of was a breaking point in Europe, uh, as far as many cultures were concerned. So the, uh, the ETH was considered the fourth technical university in the Germanic-speaking countries. And it was made after the example of Karlsruhe, which was destroyed during the Second World War. And actually, so it looks more or less like that one. It was the fourth. OK. Um, thank you very much for the invitation. What I would like to do today, I will describe the work that a student of mine and a poster of mine, Virginie Zuzaniuk, French, and Christoph Steiner, German, a Dutchman, and another uh, German, do in a Swiss laboratory. <laughs> it also tells you that uh, we are quite uh, international. Let's say half of the faculty is international, and by now half of the PhD students are uh, not coming from Switzerland. <coughs> 
we, I'll be telling you about our work on uh, transition metal phosphides and how we test them uh, as uh, hydro denitrogenation catalyst. And the test reaction is the removal of nitrogen out of an aniline. And uh, because of the, uh, uh, to, to, to have no, not about sol solubility, but let's say you close this ring, you get quinoline. So this monomolecule originally comes from quinoline. It's the first ring opening step after the hydrogenation. Then you get this one, and this is a difficult one. So if we can do this, we can do well in HDN. And the materials that you are seeing is pictures of the phosphides. I'll come back to that later. Why phosphides? Well, <coughs> people in the industry are still using sulfide, and uh, we in our group are doing a lot of sulfides. And so the classic catalyst is a nickel moly sulfide or a cobalt moly sulfide supported on aluminum. And you see phosphorus is close. This is one reason. The other reason is that it's well known that some companies are, are adding phosphate to the catalyst. So that is used today. And it's good. And I'll show you an example. <coughs> so one of our thoughts was maybe when you have phosphate there, you, you reduce <coughs> phosphate to phosphorus or to pH3, phosphine, and that reacts with the <coughs> sulfide. And at the surface, you're making a sort of phosphide, or at least some of those molybdenum have a little bit of phosphorus, and maybe that's good for you. And this is why we started testing phosphides, <coughs> just testing that ID. And let me just show you this one that shows that indeed phosphorus is good. Phosphate, this is the way you add it, is good. <coughs> Here you have the HDN, the <coughs> denitrogenation of quinoline. You do it at 30 atmospheres, uh, which is like 28 of hydrogen at, at somewhat elevated temperature. And you start hydrogenating the first ring, and then you are eventually breaking these the end bonds, and you get the nitrogen out. Let me shift it up. Now, what you see is that molybdenum by itself, in the sulfidic form, this is sulfidic acid, are reasonable. You add phosphate, not, not much happens. There's a slight increase, but it's not a good catalyst. You add nickel to the molybdenum, always add it to the molybdenum, in base case, MOS2 on aluminum. You add nickel, and you have a strong promotion effect, as you see. This is well known in the industry. This is a model reaction, but it really shows why they use either cobalt or nickel. Now you add phosphate as well, and you go up by a factor of almost two. So the phosphate is good. You test another catalyst, which is never used in the industry, but nevertheless in academia you can do it. So it is sulfide rhodium. And it's already better than molybdenum. And again, there is a phosphate effect. So we thought, gee, maybe the phosphate is getting reduced, and so you get a phosphide or some sort of that's good for you. <clears throat> we knew that it's not always good for you, or sometimes it doesn't do a thing. Like in a one atmosphere reaction, where the hydrogenation, and this is the point, is not predetermining. This is the ring opening of thiophene and hydrogenation and then the opening and removal of sulfur. That's easily done at one atmosphere at 400. You see that molybdenum is kind of, you add phosphate, not too much happen. You add nickel again, here's your promoter. Actually, it's funny why people call nickel the promoter because actually it looks like nickel. But okay, we won't talk about it today because we're going to talk about phosphate. But phosphate isn't doing a thing and for rhodium the same. So it depends on the reaction, it depends on the condition, but it could do it. So let's test phosphides. Before telling you results, let's say a few words, spend a few words on phosphides. Now first of all, they were there long before we started working on them. They were studied very well in metallurgy. In, in iron metallurgy, uh, sometimes you add a little bit of phosphorus, and uh, so uh, in in the 20s uh, and the 30s of the last century, uh, all over the Western world, people have worked hard on it, and, and all these things were known. You have the metal rich phosphide, and if I stay with nickel, it goes from any 3P to almost 1 to 1, and then there is the 1 to 1, and then the, the phosphorus rich goes to 1 to 3, the other side. So there are many. The industrial use is mainly in the semiconductor industry, of course. There's some rodent inside, there's some coding, but in heterogeneous catalysis, there isn't much use, if at all. It's all academic studies. You also have, by the way, amorphous type of, of, of phosphides, like you have boride and, and things 
like that and carbide. Uh, but then you are outside of this region and outside of that region. You have some solubility and then you can make them amorphous. So there's a rich inorganic chemistry. And the ones we started to test were the ones that are used, well, the metal that is, in hydrocheating, because, like I said in the introduction, we thought that maybe the phosphate is reduced to phosphor, so then it should explain the nickel and the moly. So we started with nickel and cobalt and moly combination, also tungsten, because tungsten is also used, not so much as molybden, but it is used in the industry as a sulfide, in combination maybe with nickel, so we have, as you see, just tested everything. We have, had, we have tested all, well, all the nickel, not only this one, but from 3 to 1 to 1 to 3, cobalt, the mixed ones, and there are several of them, 1 to 1 and 1 to 2, as Forster is concerned, and the same for tungsten and so on. There's also boronites, arsenites, and silicide. We, if I wouldn't have to retire in a couple of years, I can, could still go for a decade. <laughs> um, but the arsenides are probably no good because it's known to be poison normally. The borides we are at the moment testing, I'll say a few words at the end of my story. The silicides we have just started. And the reason is, there is one problem maybe. If we are running these reactions for hydrotreating, we, we have, if we want to do it industrial, we have to run in an atmosphere of, of sulfur containing molecules and H2S coming out. So the question is, aren't you transforming your material into a sulfide, be it after a week or after a month, so why are you studying phosphide? Well, the hope is that we can keep them. Molybdenum carbide and tungsten carbide and molybdenum nitride and tungsten carbide have been tried because they originally they have a better quality than the sulfide, but they indeed turn into a sulfide. So they are not good. They, uh, that is sort of given up by the industry. The phosphide, the, the metal to phosphide bond is much stronger than the metal to sulfur bond. So kinetically, you have a chance. Thermodynamically, of course, when you flow with h that's all the time, you have to shift the equilibrium to the sulfide side, no doubt about it. But maybe you have a chance. And this is why we have gone to the silicides, because that bond, metal to silicon, is stronger even than the phosphorus bond. So this is our program at the moment. But today, I'll mainly discuss the phosphide. What about preparation? Again. This is all going back to the 20s and 30s. There is nothing new there because I don't think you can reinvent the wheel. It's well known that when you melt them together, you can get them. That's out of the question, of course, for supported uh, system. If we want to use the material well, we want to go to high dispersion, we want to go to a alumina or whatever carrier you have. Reduction of salt with pure carbon or aluminium was beautiful in the metallurgy, but it won't work. In Reduction of salts with hydrogen, which of course in, in a way is the way to prepare a sulfide in the presence of H2S, yes, that can be done. I'll show you. Electrolysis could be done, but I don't think the industry is very eager to hear us uh, report that it's very good. They would rather wait for other methods. Reduction of salts with autohydrates, again, you're working in a solution now. Things that a uh, the organic uh, users of, of catalysis are, are well uh, used to, but not so much in the others, in the petrochemical and oil refinery industry. Or react with, for instance, if you want to go to a phosphide, react with pH 3. Like when you make a sulfide, react with H2S in the presence of hydrogen. Same for boron, same for silk. But these are much more poisonous and much more uh, flammable than, uh, than the H2S. So they're much more dangerous. I'll come back to it. Well, I'll, I, I can tell you immediately, pH 3. The biggest problem with pH 3 is uh, Gaddafi, Libya. Because up to one or two weeks ago, when he paid his debt, <laughs> uh, we were not too friendly with him, right? We were afraid that he was making war gas, yeah. nerve gas, out of any phosphorus atom. So a bottle of pH 3 is the, the basic stepping stone for going to nerve gas. So uh, in the, in, at least in Europe, we are we are uh, hardly allowed to have a bottle of P3 in the lab, and if we have it, we have to do a lot of paperwork and almost weekly to come check where all the molecules have gone. <laughs> uh, so, yes, we have it in the lab now, we use it. But, uh, 
So the, the, the first thing we tried out is this hydrogenation, this reduction with hydrogen. As I said, it was already invented in the 20s and rediscovered by Tedoyama. He was the first, let's say, in the heterogeneous catalysis to, to use it. And, and what he proposed was, and what we have also done, is take a salt, and for molybdenum, this is the classic one, ammonium heptamolybdate, good solubility in water, and take a ammonium phosphate. Mix them, evaporate them, and this is the, 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 the uh, interesting thing. If you get a glass, you, you, you evaporate it to dryness, and you get a homogeneous mixing on the molecular scale. And I think this is for molybdenum phosphate, it's very important. And then calcination, but you don't have to do it. You get an oxidic precursor, and then you start reducing it. You just flow with hydrogen. And in the end, if you go high enough in temperature, you reduce both, and they come together, and you make the phosphide. Then you can either, if you've done it in your reactor proper, you can directly use it. If you have not, you have to passivate it, and then really use the surface again. The reason is, of course, like normal with metal catalysts, you can't transport them through the air because they will ignite more or less if they are small particles. So you have to do it carefully and give them a protective oxide crust, otherwise they'll blow up. <coughs> so let me show you a few results. Uh, we started with molybdenum, first of all. Uh, this is the, the working horse for the uh, iron treating anyway. <coughs> Secondly, we already knew a lot. So ammonium heptamolybdate uh, looks like this. It's octahedrons of molybdenum surrounded by oxygen, and it's heptamolybdate, so there's seven of them. Uh, and uh, depending on the pH, uh, at high pH, you make a, a monomolecular species, the, uh, the molybdate, and at uh, low pH, it polymerizes. And you have several of them. Then in the presence of phosphate, you can, for instance, make uh, the one which you very often see, it, it's not so much pH dependent, the P2MO5O236 minus anion, also a very nice one. It's a crown of five molybdates, octahedrons, and it's a uh, two tetrahedrons of phosphorus in the middle there, just above each other, just a little bit above and a little bit below the ring, the crown ring of the five molybdates. Beautiful structure, very soluble too. Actually, it increases the solubility of the molybdenum. So in the old days, the catalyst industry was using it as a, a solubilizer until they realized it also was good for catalysis. And then they started making patents on intentionally using it for catalysis. The Raman is, of course, for the, the solution, a nice uh, vehicle to study what you have. Solution of more heptamolybdate. You have the, uh, in the, the semantic and antisemitic vibration molybdenum oxygen, and you have the bending vibration, O and O. Uh, here is the phosphate solution. Similar type of uh, vibrations, and now you add it together and you get a new structure, so it, it indeed shows that you get this uh, phosphomolybdate, and you can dry it, and now you see that you get some segregation because this is ammonium heptamolybdate, and this is the pto mo 5 so it, it partly decomposes. Now that you can reduce. <coughs> okay, I'll give you another example, I don't know where. Um, the reduction is a little bit of a problem because it shows that we had hoped when we started that we could co-reduce uh, the, um, the metal and the phosphate, but that we have not found any system where you can do it, even unsupported. The phosphate, the PO bond in phosphorus, uh, or phosphate is so strong you have to go up in temperature, it needs a higher temperature. So what happens in all cases, and here is an easy example, because nickel reduction is easier than, than molybdenum. So at lower temperature, you have a peak which you can, uh, in the temperature program reduction, fully ascribe to the reduction of nickel. So you start with making a metal particle, and your phosphate is still there. And then, probably by spillover, you, you're starting to reduce your phosphate, and then whatever species of phosphate you make there, be it a pH 3 or a volatile P4 or even a, a, a higher element of, of a ring or whatever of phosphorus that meets somewhere the nickel and you start making a reaction. And here we have changed the ratio of nickel to uh, phosphorus. 
and then by the time we have gone up quite a bit, yes, you have made a uh, molybdenum force five. Here is the uh, XRD pattern calculated, and here is what we get. So you get both lines. The particles are not that big, although we have gone up in this case to 900 Celsius. This is, of course, why, although the phosphor is made later, and the reduction of the phosphor takes place later, still it, it grows into the uh, nickel or the nickel because the temperature is high. This is one reason you also need that high temperature. So the trick would be for making better catalysts to, to reduce that phosphate at a lower temperature, or, or don't use phosphate. I'll come back to that. The uh, structures, everything is well known, so this is not our work, it's, uh, it all dates back to before the last world war, but it's a beautiful structure. It's a uh, <coughs> prism structure, so every molybdenum, or here is a phosphorus, every phosphorus is surrounded by six trigonal prism, and it's the uh, inverse of itself, so every molybdenum is from above three phosphorus and underneath also three. So uh, both the molybdenum and the phosphorus are in trigonal prismatic structure. These systems are conductors, uh, metallic properties, which also explains why you can use them in hydrogenation reactions like uh, hydrotreating. Another pictorial view, now you see the trigonal prism better. So again, <coughs> the phosphorus is coordinated by six molybdenums in trigonal prismatic structure, and the vice versa, the molybdenum is coordinated by six phosphorus. And uh, a good thing, or just another example, to just a few, and I won't show them all. Tungsten phosphide, you can also make that. The, in black, the pattern, XRD, in the red, the predicted line position, so they match, so we have made it. The structure is close, but not exactly. It's distorted. So if you look at this, it looks like trigonal prismatic and, and here too, but yes, they are distorted. So uh, the original structure is called the tungsten carbide structure, but this is distorted. The tungsten carbide structure. But it's close, as was to be expected for molybdenum and tungsten. Now, <coughs> the structures are getting prettier and prettier when you go to, for instance, nickel and cobalt. Um, now, <coughs> the, um, for instance, a phosphorus is indeed again, and it, apparently it, the, these, these phosphorus atoms like this trickle prismatic structure very much. So again, they are surrounded by six metals as nearest neighbors, but now they have what we call capped. So a square of four metals is, on top of it, is another metal. Oh, and since you have in a trigonal prismatic way, you have three side phases, every phase has a capped extra atom. So it's six plus three. So you see, and there are two of them. If you look at this structure, this one, this circle here and that, it looks like rotated and being the same, but it's slightly different. So <coughs> two types of phosphorus. And you have also two types of nickel, but the nickel is not trigonal prismatic now. The one is tetrahedral, the other is square pyramidal. So that's really different. And the two type of trickle prisms are here, and this is how they are interconnected. I always like this beautiful color, or at least my students like it. And you see, you see one column of trig trigonal symmetry. Here is the triangle, and here would be the other triangle, and now this would be the square phase. And so this one at the comes out of the phase, that's the capped. But again, it's in the middle of let's say the, the prism, but it but it's a, at the same time it's a part of the top layer of the next column of trigonal prism, but the blue and the red are slightly different. And this is why you have two types of phosphorus. One type of phosphorus in the blue columns and one type in the red columns. And the nickel are in between, either in a tetrahedral or in a trigonal, in a penta, but I again show you the nickel 2P because I'm going now to the nickel moly phosphorus and then again this is the same way but now I we have taken out lines like here so now we distinguish this one from this one 
this is trigonal prism and cap sides and here too because this would be the trigonal prism but now shifted by half a unit like you saw because those two columns were shifted by half a unit this is to indicate that there are two types and the one is actually six plus three and the three plus six but it's actually the same but you'll understand what i mean when you see the next one if you replace the one type by a molybdenum you get the following structure <coughs> in uh, blue the molybdenums and in gray the nickel so now you see you have phosphorus which have the nickel as uh, neighbors and you have a direct neighbors and you have the, uh, the ones which have the molybdenum as, the, as the neighbors so here you have a phosphorus which has six gray ones which is the nickel and three next nearest neighbors they, those are the cap molybdenums and here it's the reverse for the rest, the, the nickel and the mole are on the position where the two nickels were. But they are not disordered, they are ordered. So the, we, have, we haven't seen any structure in the literature. And also in our hand, it's always ordered. And yes, the XRD is, is, is nice. We know the structure, so we can predict the lines and it fits. Okay, so in a nutshell, to the left is the tungsten and molybdenum. They are trigonal prismatic, although this one is slightly distorted, but in a picture like this you don't see it. It's like columns of trigonal prismatic things. And all the others, cobalt, nickel, and the mixed one, are having these capped trigonal columns. There are three dimensional structures, as you now have seen. <coughs> I could have also shown you if you go perpendicular to it and then it also shows there is three-dimensional. It's totally different from MOS2. MOS2 is a slab structure. It's a pancake. A pancake of two pancakes and the marmalade in between if you, if you wish, which is the molybdenum and the nickel. This is the nice element which is doing all the goodies for you. And the, uh, the sulfur is the, the two pancakes. Right? This is different. So this could be having catalysis on, on every surface. Okay, so we made them unsupported. Now the question is, and we have measured the catalysis, I'll come to that, I'll show you later, but I'll first go to um, support it. Let's go support it, because eventually the idea is uh, that's what we want, to make good use and, and have a good dispersion. Now comes the problem. Apparently, when you start with a aqueous solution, they're homogeneous and mixed. When you then dry it, it forms a sort of glass, and they are, again, very nicely mixed. And then you start uh, reducing it. Then there is a problem, because the metal starts using first. And so then there is already the question, where is the phosphate? Still in uh, homogeneously mixed with the molybdenum or not? And how do they find each other? And so on. So already there, there is a question, which we haven't answered yet. We're working on that. How, how is that really going on and what do we learn from it and what then are the pitfalls? But now we already go one step up because that's what we want to do and that is, what about the support? And now we have a third element. I mean, it's not an element, but let's say a, a material. And now you have the problem that one of the two or both can be in interaction with this third element, with this material. And lo and behold, the phosphate is having a very nice interaction with aluminum. And it even has an, has an interaction with silica. So the first thing is that already in solution, you may get a segregation or in, during the drying. That the phosphate loves the support and leaves the molybdate for the solution and that crystallizes out separately later because and you never get a homogeneous glassy type of a mixture. There's another reason which I learned from a um, colloid chemist. He said you shouldn't have expected a glassy situation in the pores in the first place, because the osmotic pressure will not allow it in the small pores. So you should expect a glass, if it's glass forming, like phosphates and borates are, but you should expect not a glass in the pores. So in the pores you'll be in trouble. That was he said, even if, they, if the solubility would be good answer. You might have segregation. So we didn't go for aluminum in the first place, and uh, Tetoyama tried it, and he failed. <coughs> like we expected, and he solved it by giving it loads of tons of, uh, of phosphate, as it were. So he just smeared the, the pores almost full of phosphate, so that there was a good interaction between phosphate and aluminum. 
And then he added additional force strength, and that was then free, as it were, to, to react with the molecule. Then he got it. And that is to be expected because that is like you are making an aluminum phosphate and then you come with phos uh, phosphate and then it doesn't interact and then it's free, like, almost like an unsupported system because he, he went to extremely high loading. And then, of course, you make big particles anyway. So we opted for silica to, to, to make our feet wet. We are also working with carbon, but the pores are small, so it's not so nice. Um, this is what Virginie is using on their bit. So, in the beginning, we had a support with 500 square meters per gram. If you go up in temperature with this support itself, you already lose a lot. And if there is phosphorus, you, you, you lose even more. It, uh, it likes often also with alumina, there is this interaction, and you sort of have a chemical interaction, and you probably smear or even destroy the microspores. So, you lose a lot of the surface. You don't lose as much if there is a metal there because part of the phosphate work is already in interaction with the metal, so it doesn't have much to react with the silica. But you do lose. The metal crystallite size that we get out uh, as a phosphide is like this. So we're talking about in nanometers, like 100, 200 angstroms. So they are quite large, or they are, they just can go in the pores. It's limiting, so it's still too big just to indicate that you can make it. Uh, here is an example I was looking for. Uh, now with molybdenum, again, you see in the TPR that the molybdenum is reduced first, now it's on the silica, and then eventually come. Well, this is molybdenum six plus to four plus. The molybdenum metal uh, reduction, the, the four plus to the zero is, is here. Mm -hmm. So now it's a co-reduction with the phosphate. But you have to go up because, uh, let's say you are here, temperature you are uh, at 1000 K, quite high. And that's also why you lose support surface. But you do make the material, you have to see. So, uh, <coughs> these are the predicted lines and there they are, and the rest, the broad lines are the silicon lines. So yes, on the silica you can make it. You have to give a little bit, a sniff more phosphorus than needed for stoichiometry. You have to give the support something. And uh, it looks like you're making phosphosilicate. We can do the same with uh, with other metals uh, like cobalt and tungsten, and it's okay. Um, we also have another way of looking at it, and that's NMR. And uh, let me just give you a few nice pictures here of the cobalt, cobalt moly phosphorus, tungsten moly. This is supported, and then I'll show you a few unsupported, and I'll say a few words. These are the unsupported force fight. This is what we did, did to, to study the system. So it's <coughs> molybdenum force fight is having peaks like a few hundred ppm. Tungsten force fight as well. Cobalt force fight has, a, has a, well, three, five peaks around 2,200 or so, and then the nickel, uh, nickel force fight has one here. And there must be another one, there it is. Around 4,000 ppm, and the nickel moly is lower again. Now, watch this scale, thousands of ppm. So in the first place, if you don't know where they are, you, you, you will never find them. So you have to roughly know where they are. And you really have to run the whole range of the spectrometer. And I look at, for instance, just one spectrum. It, it, it is by itself several hundreds of ppm. Why? What is, why, what is the reason? Well, we are talking about metallic systems. Molybdenum and tungsten less so than the nickel and cobalt. So you get huge night shift. You have unpaired electron density at the metal atom, and that, of course, uh, shifts the NMR line tremendously. And that's what you're seeing. So uh, not everything was known in the literature. Some lines we really had to find, and that was hard work. But once you know where they are, it's fantastic, of course. Because we are talking about phosphides, and phosphorus has a nuclear spin one half, so you don't have those problems with uh, spin one and higher that you have, like quadrupolar uh, problems like aluminium. And here they are supported, and, uh, and, and you can see that. And you can distinguish them from phosphate, because the phosphate would be around zero, that's here. And on this scale, it all falls on one very sharp line, even though 
pyrophosphates and polyphosphates are different from phosphate. You can see that. But on this scale, you wouldn't see the difference. And you don't have to, because you want to know, have I reduced it or not? There is one snag. If you see both of them, you cannot directly compare in a normal spectrum the intensity and say, oh, I, I've done well or I've done not well in far as, as far as the reduction is concerned. Because these systems relax very fast because they are metallic like So they have these uh, conduction electrons to help in uh, getting the nuclear spin tumble back to its own pos old position, which you don't have in the phosphate. So the relaxation times are extremely different, and you have to take care. So if you want to go for quantification, you have to do what we call a spin echo experiment, where this is not a problem, but that's somewhat more complicated. So you don't want to do it every day and every hour. But for a qualitative scan, it's nice. And you can do it at home in, in situ pro. And uh, that's nice. So we use it heavily. We, we do have a lot of NMR time, and that helps. Now, let's start talking a little bit about catalysis. As I already alluded to, we have used uh, the uh, hydrogen oxygenation of aniline type with the propyl group because that came out of the quinoline work and it gives you good properties, no problem, and we knew a lot about it. Uh, Tetoyama has used a mixture of uh, quinoline, uh, benzthiophene, and the like. So he uses always a sulfur compound as well. Uh, which we did not want to do. We wanted to test the pure phosphide to make sure what it's doing. We, as I will show you, we have also tested this system in the presence of, of some H2S to see how sulfur sensitive it is. But we have, and this is different from, from what the Oyama group has done, they have never tested their phosphide sulfur field. So if you see their results, it's always a very nice hydrotreating, almost real mixture. Yeah. Two spike components, the one in hydrogen taking containing and the other sulfur containing. Quite difficult molecule, so it's really telling you something. What is the reaction network? Well, it's quite easy. The, if you run it on a sulfidic catalyst, there is a minor path which we call hydrogenolysis. So there's the CN bond breakage and the smearing off with hydrogen atoms. That's what we call hydrogenolysis. And you would make toluene. And this is on a nickel moly catalyst in the normal conditions, below 10%, let's say 8% or so. I'll show you it's higher here. Nevertheless, the major route <coughs> also on a phosphide is hydrogenation. Because the CN bond, I mean, I've written it like an organic chemist, would do a single line, but it's not a, a, a single bond, it, it borrows because of the lone pair from the aromaticity. So it's it's partly in conjugation, as it were. So it's more than a single bond. It's on the way to a double bond. That's why it's so different. But once you have hydrogenated it, it's a real single bond. So now you can do whatever type of chemistry is responsible for it. And I won't go into the details what we think it is. But you can either do, let's say, an elimination, take out ammonia, and you get a double bond. Or you can cleave it directly, you go to here, so you can go here to here or directly to here. If you would have acidity, <coughs> because you are going through an olefin, and I'll show you we have quite a bit of olefin, you could see some um, isomerization to fibrin structures, as is well known over acidic catalysts. And you don't need much acidity to do that. That's a very nice thing. So let's say you, you will see the direct formation of toluene, and you will see you won't see this. Apparently, this reacts very fast. So we, we, we have never seen it in the phosphide. We have seen it with, with sulfide. But you have to work very hard on it. Um, OK, there are some tricks. But okay, but in phosphide, we haven't been able to see that yet. But all the other products we have seen, I'll show you. As I said, we have tested it three ways. After having prepared a catalyst, <coughs> no H2S there, then we added H2S, and then we went back and removed the H2S and just flowing with hydrogen to see how it recovered or improved or whatever it was going to do. I'll first give you some results for the uh, unsupported systems, and here is the tungsten and molybdenum 
and those are the trigonal systems, remember, and they are good. Before means without H2S. Then in the Thompson case, you add H2S, it's even improved, and you remove the H2S and it stays. In the molybdenum case, it is not as nice as that, but still it's not bad. This is a mistake, this should be in the case. So we started with this line, just increasing the space time, of course you get higher conversion, but look, you, you can go up to high conversions, it's, it's really good. Then you add H2S, it goes down, then you remove the H2S and it even comes up better. So you are restructuring the surface probably, maybe some sulfate left and, and a mixed whatever at the surface is even better, we don't know. We have to do a lot of surface characterization of these systems, which we hope to do. We, uh, our colleague now has his expensive instrument running, he had problems for months with it, and now we, we hope to look at it and really see how much is still there. This, of course, then you should do with room supported system, because that's easier to do. The other systems are similar. Just to give you a few. Some are really reacting, so like cobalt. First of all, now I, uh, I have to use quite a space time to, to get a conversion, and still I'm, I'm nowhere, I'm far away from the 100%, so cobalt phosphide is not as good. This is without, and now it, uh, it's bad with H2S, and it doesn't come up as much. And the same for the nickel before and with, but it recovers. But still, this activity is not very good. I'll give you a comparison of all the activities later. But then the mixed compounds, they behave somewhat better. They're sort of in between. Conversion level is not as high, but their reaction to HUS is not, uh, they are not very sensitive. And now let's try the supported system. So and we have concentrated a lot on molybdenum because we found that in the unsupported system, after correcting for surface area, that this was by far the most active one. So we have in the uh, supported system of silica we looked at. And again, you get the same pattern. Without any H2S, you have a uh, nice activity. You put H2S on it, and it goes down a little bit. And after H2S, you pump it away, and you start all over, and it had improved. So it is a, a promising pattern. Our reactions are run for about a week. Um, there is some sulfur at the surface when we run it, and we have done the initial uh, analysis, but not very much, so we don't know is if it's really a transformation of the surface, but we have to, to study that. But they are still good. <clears throat> but we have never run longer than one week. And again, like in the unsupported one, the cobalt is uh, <coughs> not so good. And it's, uh, look, the axis is now, we were talking about uh, 10, 20, 30 in the other case. And now you have to go to really high space time to get something out of your cobalt. And then it reacts dramatically on the H2S in a very bad way. The tungsten, not so much, but it's not a very active. So here I have a table with the corrected results. These are the samples. <coughs> Cobalt, molybdenum, tungsten, nickel moly, cobalt moly, nickel moly. Uh, the dispersion, which we measured by carbon monoxide titration. Just assuming that, uh, that one metal atom absorbs uh, one CO, there isn't much infrared work yet on it. Uh, there are groups starting on it, and it looks like that is true. So we have just used it. And then you can calculate the number of metal atoms at the surface. You know your conversion, and you, you uh, divide the two, and you get an intrinsic activity, a sort of quasi turnover number. And you see that the molybdenum is good. The cobalt looks good, but it, it had a. Uh, uh, you needed quite a bit in it, and the dispersion is not good. So the other one's not. So in, we believe that the, it's the molybdenum which is the best. This had a very low surface area, so we, we really couldn't determine the, the number of surface atoms, and therefore it, it makes no sense. But it looks like in the unsupported system it was not very good. So if I combine supported and unsupported, we believe that uh, the molybdenum is the best. 
Now let's look again at the selectivity because I have given you now conversions. What about what is what is it making? Again, the direct break of the bond or the indirect. Again, we have never seen this, and these are the two main products: the olefin and the final total hydrogen. What do we see? A slightly busy figure, but nevertheless, I'll guide you through it. It's molybdenum phosphide, one to one. The full lines are without H2S. The dotted lines are with H2S. So let's first start with the full lines. Now, what we see is this is as a function of conversion now. So selectivity as a function of conversion. So what you see at a uh, low conversion, you have a high, almost 50% conversion to the olefin. And you have a low conversion to the fully hydrogenated system. And that's reasonable because this is the primary product, as it were. And this is the secondary. So that's what we expect. What you see is that the toluene, the direct bond breakage, is not is much higher than what it is in the sulfide. There, as I said, it's like 8% only. Well, here, the tech plays back maybe also to 50 so it's high. So this reacts like a metal. If you would do it on a metal, nickel metal or, or molybdenum metal or platinum metal, you would indeed cleave this bond very easily. That's called hydrogen It comes from metal. Catalysis. You, you could even go further there. And for instance, Alex Bell has done it 10 years ago when he did the, the, the propyl aniline. You can even chop off a propyl group one by one by one because that's the mechanism. One, two cc atoms adsorb on the surface and it's cleaved and so you just chop it off one by one so you see propyl benzene, ethyl benzene, toluene. Uh, that's what you don't see on the phosphide. You do see this cleaving on CM1 but there is no hydrogen also for of the alkyl chain. So it's really different. It's not a metal. Absolutely not a metal. So it proves that what we have at the surface is a different system. So it has metallic properties but it, so it's a not so good metal. And it's nice because it doesn't chop off then the alkyl chain. You don't like to lose all the carbon atoms to methane. Right? When you add H2S, it changes slightly. The toluene goes down, not so much. So we are not making a sulfide. That's what it proves. If you add the H2S, it's not an MOS2. Because otherwise, the selectivity to toluene would have been 8%. It's not. <coughs> It just decreased a little bit. So maybe you are just absorbing H2S and blocking some sites. And that's what you do. <coughs> and then the olefin goes down, and then automatically the balance is then that the, uh, where's the dotted line here? The fully hydrogenated product just goes up. There is a slight, as you see, a higher conversion. There's a slight isomerization. So there is some oxidic, uh, sorry, acidic activity. That might be because of the procedure of making the catalyst. It was passivated and regenerated in hydrogen. But if you would go to some molybdenum oxide in the passivation, it might be that the molybdenum oxide is not fully brought back to the molybdenum phosphide and then it's slightly acidic. That might explain this. Okay, so far so good. What we think is that um, the system is promising and that, uh, as I said, in our hands, the order is that the molybdenum is the best and totally different from, uh, let's say, the sulfide field. The combination of cobalt moly is, is, is actually not. So there is no promotion effect of the cobalt on the molybdenum. Well, why should it? I mean, it's a totally different system, so it doesn't have to be. But of course, you test it. Why the molybdenum is the best, we don't know. I think uh, we need theoretical calculations to explain that. Okay. So far, so good for the phosphides. I will give you a flavor of the borides that we have uh, just started. And it might, if you listen carefully, give you a flavor of where we are already with the phosphides, but I won't say anything about the phosphides. I already showed you this sheet, how you can make a, a phosphide boride or Side. You can do solid state reaction, you, re, you reduce with a uh, not very nice reducing agent, you can do it with hydrogen, we have seen that, and that didn't work too well. And the reason was also because the phosphate 
is, is, is a difficult thing to, to endure. So you have to go up to high temperatures and then you sinter, and, and that's what, not what you like eventually in supported systems. Electrolysis, forget it. The borohydride, we have given it a try. But let's go to the method which you use with H2S, I mean, in the sulfide in the first place. So why not, as I said? And we bought a bottle of PH3 after having done the paperwork. The, the boron hydride and the silicon hydride is, is easier to get, but they're very pyrophoric, and uh, you can get a lot of corrosion. And uh, in that year, uh, Peter was there. I'll show you a reactor that Peter made for my student. We're destroyed. My student <laughs> made it again. Uh, and it worked. <coughs> and actually, that is a good method. Now. But first, just plain reduction with hydrogen doesn't work for the bor boring because the, not, the for instance, a sample like nickel borate is, is, you can get the metal out of it, but we, we completely failed and she tried a lot uh, to make a nickel borate. Uh, so this method, method doesn't work. <coughs> of course, like I said, you can go uh, to a borane or borohydride, and yes, that works. And we have done a lot. I, uh, these we have done now. We are now working on the supported system. These are at the moment unsupported, and she's now trying them supported. And we have also tried this one. Let me first show you an example that it's really true that we got it, and then I'll show you one of these. So the, um, the reduction with sodium borohydride, you get the CO3B, and here is the yeah, calculated XRD that you should get, and this is what we got, and it's on the top. That is a, a good method if that's what you want. But of course, it's through uh, aqueous solution. And uh, we don't even go, we are not even going to try it uh, on a support. So when Peter was in our lab, he, we have now this ASR, as, as uh, Luciana called it, it means the Adat Smyrniotis reactor. It's just a normal reactor, but the, the business is here. It's the panel where you have the, uh, the hydrides and how you flow them in. And the, the real trick is this to, to, uh, to uh, flow through the head of the cylinder to, to uh, purify it and to make sure that the air is out because otherwise you are in, in danger. Uh, and so that, that is really what, what it's all about. <coughs> we, we have tried also chlorides. That's of course another possibility, but at the moment in our hands, the hydrides are, are very good. So uh, you, you purify your system, you flow, and, and you helium, and so on, and so on, and then in the end you come with your more hydride, or silicon hydride, or PX3, as you might guess by now. And you go through and you get it. <clears throat> so we normally use the chlorides for that because then you have the HCl as a leaving group which helps and indeed that works and these are the temperatures and then you anneal them um, the annealing is only done to make sure that you can see it in XRD um, the problem with boron is that it is a nucleus which has a spin higher than one half so it's a quadripolar nucleus and it's really difficult so um, we cannot use in-house NMR on it, so we have to go to XPS, and the instrument of my colleague didn't work that well, so we have some spectra, we have seen it. The other thing to do is exas. That's a beautiful technique, but you have to apply for measuring time, which of course you get, and then you have to go every three months or so to a place, in our case, in Grenoble, which is an hour by day's drive, and then you, you have uh, four or five days measuring time, day and night, 24 hours a day, so you have to send half your lab to go to the student because otherwise nobody gets any sleep. And, uh, and then as you know, when you do your first experiment, you always fail. So you come home, you know, oh God, I made a mistake. Then you go the second time, you make another mistake. So by the end of the year, you have good result. So it's, it's a nice technique, and we like it a lot, but uh, it would be nice to have a quicker check on, on if we made a bore eyes or force light or whatever. So it's, we are betting on the HPN. For the, uh, for the boron. But here you see, this is why we sinter it, to make sure that we sinter it and then we get particles big enough to be seen by XRD. 
So when you see that after five hours of reaction, you do see the particles uh, to, to, to be there. And uh, this is the expected line with the minus arrow because there is no rotting because of particle size. So yes, this method of flowing with a boron hydride or a pH 3 or an SIH4 but you have to be extremely careful. I mean, in the, in, the, um, in the chips industry, of course, they do it daily, but they've set it up well. We are just poor students and poor professors. So, in conclusion, we believe that, uh, that especially molyphosphide is very good. M many of these phosphides have an activity and they're quite good, but several of them are not as good as, let's say, the, the, the top of the uh, market type of present catalyst, which is a nickel moly or a nickel tungsten. So to be able to beat that or be close, you have to stay with the monophosphate at the moment. Uh, some of them are strongly influenced, but some of them are hardly influenced by H2S, and they recover when you take it away. I mean, the monophosphate, luckily enough, is not much influenced. So we don't lose much. So we think that with the classic Oyama recipe, they're easily to, easy to make, but you make big particles. So we, and then on a support, you have big problems. So on a support, we think that a technique like pH3 is a lot better, and we have already proved that. And we have another trick, but we have just better it. So I'm not able to tell you what it is. It's close, but not though. And then we think that in-house uh, spectroscopy, like phosphorus spectroscopy, so NMR spectroscopy, is, is very nice. If we would have our own XPS, we would have gone for the XPS. But the XPS, of course, doesn't have as fine a resolution as, as I showed you for the NMR. Because of the night shift, the, the, they are thousands of ppm apart. So it's very easy to distinguish whatever you have there. Whereas the XPS, you have to look at the phosphorus line. Now, of course, the phosphate, which is the oxidation state 5 plus, can be easily distinguished by the oxidation state 3 minus for the phosphate, formally 3 minus. Maybe it's covalent at 0, but 5 and, and zero is still five steps in oxidation, which means like almost five electron volts. So that's an easy job. But the, from the metal side, you may be in more difficulty. So we like very much that we found that the NMR is, is very good and we are using it with heavily and also because we have the definition. So we are uh, working hard on this and uh, uh, we have a, a student and a, and a postdoc now yeah, they're working on the characterization and, and going on with this and see how far we can go. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rolf. A very interesting uh, report on a uh, not, not, not widely used catalyst system, but maybe it will change in the future. Uh, we have a lot of chance for discussion and questions now, please. I have a couple of questions. One, uh, is, uh, does this system work only when you have small size crystals from a catalytic activity point of view? No, the unsupported systems were, were quite big particles, so they, they work. So but it doesn't really matter what the size of the crystal is? No, it didn't look like it, but, but, <clears throat> but you are, of course, wasting a lot of the material at the inside. So uh, this is why we strive, like always, in catalysis for, for small particles. But if you are willing to, to, to spend your money on, on, on the molybdenum being inside, no problem. And as you may know, uh, for those of you who are in the field, um, Exxon, together with Arzo, developed a catalyst which is called Nebula, which is almost an unsupported system. So they went in the classic sulfide field to an unsupported system. They, so you have a lot more nickel and moly there than in a supported one. On the other hand, you don't support it, so you must expect the particles to be bigger. So you lose again because of the dispersion, as we call it. But apparently, there is a uh, benefit still, because they claim that their activity is four times higher. So yes, it's if okay. they would be willing to go for the unsupported, <coughs> you could do it. This is what Ayama claims. Why don't we use it unsupported? Yeah. Uh, just a question on the mechanism. Is the amine uh, you know, specifically absorbing on the Molly site, and then because of the geometry that's breaking up, or I could tell you a lot definite results on the sulfides, but I don't know anything about the phosphide. I might um, 
guess that it's similar. Um, the mechanism which we, which is now coming out every day in Journal of Catalysis by us and another paper to come, and is the following. And this is against what was in the literature. The old idea was you hydrogenate your aromatic system, you have an aliphatic type of an amine. Uh, for instance, pyridine goes to piperidine. Then how do you break the first CN bond? They thought it was an elimination. So you get a double bond. The beta hydrogen atom goes, goes away, you get a double bond, and your nitrogen breaks loose. The CN bond is broken. Take a, take a hexylamine. Makes it easier. The C, or, or, a meth, or, or ethylamine. Ethylamine is the most easy example. Here is the nitrogen, here is the alpha carbon, here is the beta. So you take a hydrogen away here, and you take the NH2 group here, and automatically you have ethylene. That's well, called elimination. In, in all of these mechanisms, where is the surface playing role? OK. In this mechanism, the NH2 bends to the surface yeah. and goes to an acidic side, and the hydrogen is going to a basic side. So it's an acid-base catalyzed mechanism. We now prove this is not true. And the reason it was overlooked is the following. What really happens is that you get a substitution. The NH2 group is substituted by H2S. So the H2S reacts with the amine on the alpha carbon atom, throws out the NH2, and in comes the SH. So you get a tile. Why didn't they see it? Why didn't we see it for decades? Well, we, haven't, we didn't look carefully enough. <coughs> and the reason is that the tile very quickly decomposes through an elimination to an olefin. So all the time we thought this alkene was coming from the amine, and it was coming from the tile. And the amount of tile that you have there is so small because the subsequent reaction, the follow reaction, is so fast that this concentration is being drawn down. Now we have looked with special techniques at it, and well, that's sure, that's the mechanism.